Welcome back to the second part of this first lesson today. Uh, the first lesson is called the Gospel Grid, and it falls under the first of three uh, groupings, if you will, that is entitled, What is the Gospel? So again, for us to understand the role of holiness in the Christian's life, uh, it really all has to start with our appreciation uh, for the gospel and also our commitment to it. Um, a Christian, a follower of Christ, who does not appreciate Christ's um, letter to us, his word, because the Bible is Christ's word. It's God's word, and Christ was God himself in the flesh. Uh, a Christian who does not have room for the word of God in his or her life uh, can hardly be called a Christian, probably. Um, and so it's very, very important that we look at that, because in the Bible we come uh, to discover answers to two uh, basic questions, and that is um, our understanding of God and also our understanding of who we are as human beings made in the image of God. In order to fully understand or to at least understand the gospel, the message of salvation, we have to have a proper understanding of God. If we don't know who God is, um, what he has done, um, what salvation means in light of who God is and so forth, then, um, yeah, then we're just uh, um, scratching the surface and uh, we're not really um, uh, deepening our faith um, and it can't grow very deep at all. Uh, we, we must have uh, a proper understanding of who God is and also uh, who we are ourselves. And I mentioned those uh, two basic questions because um, the people have a variety of opinions about God. And the trouble with uh, most of those um, sort of deviating views um, about God is that they're not found in God's word. So it is so important for you to be actually saved that your understanding of who God is and therefore who Christ is, uh, is a biblical one. Within the Christian tradition, maybe you know people like that, there are those who have a very high view of God. Their churches may have a high view of God. For example, in churches that are very um, oriented toward the liturgical, uh, they have uh, colorful robes, the pastors do, and maybe the other officiants do. Um, a lot of ceremony, ex excuse me, external ceremony, um, forms, uh, responsive readings, and so forth. A very high view of God. But is that God who is so high and exalted also the God who comes close to us. Do we know this God in his personal attributes as, for example, as our Heavenly Father? And if we have a father and we're young, especially, we like to be close to that father. We like to sit on his lap. We like to be held by him and hugged by him. You can have a high view of God, but this God is a distant God, a cold God. You cannot know him really well. Sometimes our views of God are um, impaired because of our own experiences with uh, our earthly fathers. And so that image of fatherhood needs to be corrected. And the only way I know how is for you and I to read God's Word once again. Because in God's Word we find the one who is the flawless Father, the perfect Father, the Father who doesn't change, who doesn't uh, renege on His promises, 
who is always present, not absent, even in the mystery of his providence where we can't figure him out. We can't understand why he directs our lives the way he does. The fatherhood of God is flawless and we ought to pattern our understanding uh, of our relationships with, uh, with, uh, with people in this world on that. There are people who have a high view of God, but it just leaves their lives unchanged. So God is out there, but he hasn't come in their heart, if you will. And so we see a lot of formalism in their lives. They may go to church, they may not go to church, but they, they, they seem to think that Christianity is just about a list of, of do's and don'ts, and you perform, and you show up at church uh, at the right moments, and so forth. God is in their lives a kind of means to another end, and it's not a godly end so much, but it is to uh, improve their own life situations, you might say. Uh, for some, God is not the God who demands, well, he demands, but um, uh, he is not the God who is our Lord and Savior, and we joyfully and willingly place ourselves under his lordship, um, but rather God is, uh, again, sort of the one we have in our lives as a, as a safety measure, as an insurance policy. Uh, maybe he serves as our life coach, you know, he helps us to be better in our jobs or marriages and, and so forth. Yeah, and then, of course, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, there are people who have an extremely low view of God. I spoke um, with uh, relatives back in Europe uh, and, uh, they, and, and some people there who have abandoned the biblical view of God, the biblical uh, old-time religion uh, understanding of the Christian faith, a personal God who sent his son, who died on the cross, who performed miracles, walked on water, changed water into wine, uh, who is the redeemer of the world uh, through his blood. Our sins are atoned for all of that and more, the resurrection, uh, all denied, all, uh, all denied, um, and this God himself is uh, not the one who reveals himself, discloses himself, as we believe in Orthodox Christianity, uh, but rather they refer to him as an it. He's not a personal God anymore, but this God is referred to as an it. And if I think of it, I don't know what I'm thinking about too much but it isn't my, very much. It is maybe an idea, a principle. And that's tragic that uh, the Christian church has uh, come to fall so low uh, in its confidence in the word of God that reveals to us by its own claims the very God who made heaven and earth and is a personal God who can be known and loved and be loved by uh, through the ones he made. And then, of course, it's important to understand who I am. Well, we already mentioned that uh, part of our identity uh, is that um, we are made by God and in his image. Um, but there are a lot of people who have different opinions about um, man, shall we say, humanity. Uh, man, for many, is nothing more but the result of a biological evolutionary process. Uh, for some people, uh, Christian people, uh, man has evolved not from Adam and Eve, but uh, from more prim primitive life forms uh, to what uh, we are today. And so these people want to both give credence to God as the creator but the account that we find in Genesis 1 and 2 um, is, uh, is more about, um, yeah, sort of a fable rather than a description of uh, what God, in fact, uh, in history and time accomplished by his fiat or his will. And so they believe basically in the theory of evolution, uh, Big Bang theory, uh, the, the, the age of the cosmos, uh, and the earth included uh, billions of years old and so forth. Um, so in that view, there's simply no, no place for a historical Adam and Eve. And it is my understanding of uh, Paul's writing in the New Testament that if you 
uh, excise Adam and Eve from the picture, from the genealogy. Um, and you wonder why genealogies are even worth mentioning if, uh, historically speaking, um, some of these people that I mentioned uh, didn't even exist. Uh, and especially uh, are the, the, the one with whom uh, humanity began, according to God's account, Adam and Eve, if they didn't exist, uh, what about sin? Maybe we don't have to worry all that much about sin. Because sin is sin, because Adam and Eve sinned, and in their sin we all fell, according to the scripture. So, it's very important that we have a biblical view of, of, of mankind, made in his image, and, uh, and we are uh, created as responsible people. The word responsibility, if you place a hyphen at some point in that word to separate response and ability, then uh, you have um, the acknowledgement that God holds mankind responsible because he has endowed us with the ability to respond to him in one way or another. And thanks to sin, subsequent to Adam and Eve, all their offspring have nothing but an inclination towards sin, which can only be remedied when God sovereignly, mercifully intervenes and by his Holy Spirit gives us a new heart. So it's important to know who God is in his might, in his majesty, in his glory, how he reveals himself in this world, in creation. From creation we know there is a creator. Paul says no person is without excuse. All can be held accountable on the day of judgment. Isn't that a thought? That somehow people who ever lived, if they have the age of accountability, um, they can be held accountable by God because God created us, endowed us with this knowledge of God. And so we are spiritual beings. We are religious beings. But thanks to sin, and due to sin, we are bent inward. Um, Augustine used to uh, teach in the early church. We have an inward bent uh, and not an upward bent. Our souls gravitate towards the world, the creation, the finite, and not the infinite, the infinite, the eternal. So important to know what we believe and what scripture believes about humanity. In the early church, there was a man at the time of, Pel of uh, Augustine, roughly, uh, his name was Pelagius. Now, Pelagius didn't believe in a biblical doctrine of sin at all. Uh, sin, at uh, its worst, was learned by people. So people decide to sin, and uh, sin can be taught by example. Um, and so uh, sin is doing wrong, is making mistakes, but sin is not culpability, uh, is not guilt. Uh, for which a savior needs to come to, um, to acquit us all from that. Um, now, when we look at uh, what scripture teaches about these matters, I want to focus your attention on what we find in Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. We read there the following. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Again, Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. Well, this is one example of a passage that teaches us about who God is and who we are, doesn't it? It surely teaches us the creator-creation distinction that theologians um, have come up with so helpfully. It tells us that God is 
standing above it all. And that while he has created us and created everything in this world, he doesn't become part of it so as to sort of limit himself in that way. We see that happen um, in Oriental religion. Uh, but God is the creator and he is distant from his creation because he has not created himself. He is eternal. But he is intimately involved in his creation. And so we believe that God is both high above, transcendent, and he is also intimately and personally involved in our lives, in creation, and we call that imminence. Those are two things to keep in mind always when we think about reality, uh, life in this world, and purpose and meaning and so forth. So the gospel grid is that principle that reminds us that we are created by God and that God is forever um, infinitely higher than we are. But he has a relationship with us. He created us. And he does that by way of the image that he placed upon us. Therefore, God can hold us accountable. In the few minutes that we have left, I want to um, point out this graph and then we'll close our session today with, with this graph and the um, uh, things that it teaches us. So here we have a graph that says on the top, awareness of God's holiness. Here is a timeline and at some point here you and I were converted God placed a new heart in us from a heart of stone he gave us a heart of flesh and we started to desire God and love God and accept his forgiveness through faith in Christ at any point here somewhere that begin that began and as soon as we were converted the cross of Christ, of course, starts to play a role in our lives. And so shall we say that this is the point of conversion. And at the point of conversion, the cross takes a more and more prominent, bigger role in our lives. I find it very helpful to be uh, depicted this way. We lived before in sin and misery. We did not know God the way we know God now in his mercy and grace. We know that through Christ, his death on the cross, we have been pardoned from all our sin. And so what do you see that is characteristic of a true follower of Jesus? Two things. One, there is a growing awareness of God's holiness, a growing awareness of God's holiness. What do I mean by that? I mean by that simply to say that God plays a factor. He, is a, he plays a role in my life on a day-to-day -day basis. These are not moments that are reserved for mealtime prayer, but throughout the day, God is on our minds because he is in our hearts. And he is actively taking his place and, and work within us because he comes in us through his word. The Bible, the Old and the New Testament scriptures, they come and, they, and we hear them and we believe them and we treasure them, we study them. We have a growing awareness of God's amazing love and grace and holiness. And at the same time, we have a growing awareness of our own sinfulness. That is the strange tension that every true follower of Jesus can talk about with you. Every true believer has an awareness of God's holiness and that becomes the backdrop to an awareness that's also very prominent 
the more I know God, the more I know about my own sinful depravity. The more I love God, the less I love myself. Because I see more clearly why, how stupendous it was for God to do the unthinkable, the impossible, you might say. He sent his own son into our world. He was hung on a cross so that we can sit here today and discuss these matters with one another and rejoice in the fact that we are God's children. We have identities that no one can take from us. No discussion about gender or race or justice or any other things that this world is currently so preoccupied with. We are who we are. Regardless of any talk, any cultural, societal discussion, debate, the Christian is a child of God, created in his image and restored in that image uh, because of the sanctifying work of Jesus' blood through the operation of the Holy Spirit. So as we grow in grace, as we live and walk in grace, we become more aware of God's role in our lives, more appreciative of what he's done for us. And in light of that, we have a greater desire to put sin down in our lives, to mortify it, to kill it, um, you might say, with the words really of um, Paul himself in such letters as the letter to the Colossians, um, to mortify the sins of the flesh in, a row, in order that the fruit of the Holy Spirit may become more abundant in you and me as we live our lives for Christ. Thank you for your attention. God bless you. And we'll meet again for our second lesson, which will be about the topic of pretending and performing. Thank you.